Hi, this is Matt McCormick at the Department of Philosophy, California State University, Sacramento. This is my second lecture on Stanislas Dehaene and Lionel Nakash's article toward a cognitive neuroscience of consciousness, basic evidence and a workspace framework, part two. Okay, so you'll recall that in the first half of this lecture, in the early part of the article, we covered uh, some of the empirical groundwork here that led Dehaene and Nakash to conclude that lots of our cognitive processing is unconscious. They've called that C0. Um, the process whereby um, cognitive, low-level cognitive representation gets uh, boosted into this thing we're going to call consciousness is attention. And they've been developing a, we're starting to see how they're developing a theory about how that happens. And then consciousness is uh, required, they've argued, um, to create sustained representations that are durable, that the uh, mind or these cognitive systems then, then can go to work on and share between different uh, modules or different subsystems. Um, so they make it possible for us to remember uh, to perform novel combinations of operations in order for us to plan and form intentional behavior. It, they enable us to um, engage in imagination, planning, deciding, problem solving, and so on. Uh, that's what we covered in part one. And the question now is, can we build a comprehensive theory, a neuroscientific theory, that folds in all of the research we have about how neurons work? And their answer to that question is something they call global workspace theory. So it's a particular account of how it is that neurons are able to do that. Um, and the process of uh, what they're trying to do is they're synthesizing and they're trying to put together a, a lot of empirical research and the process of doing so and stipulating uh, an answer to how this happens at the neural level, they're obviously going to come across several philosophical problems, ones that we've been uh, dealing with all semester, including a, a bunch of topics that philosophers have been, you know, trying to figure out from the inside out, so to speak. So introspection has revealed a number of interesting puzzles about the nature of, uh, of consciousness, and um, their neuroscientific theory is getting us closer and closer to the mechanisms that are um, informing us at that subjective level. So that's what we're going to see a good part of today. Um, okay, so the question of section 4.1 is um, concerns whether the unconscious mind is modular. Uh, what does that mean? Well, global workspace theory is not going to be modular. Consciousness is not modular. So that's why they're invoking this um, language here. Uh, there are automatic or unconscious uh, cognitive processes that arise from many dedicated processors or modules that do operate in isolation. So there's a number of unconscious um, a lot of cognitive work that gets done at the low level that is modular, uh, but in some important philosophical ways, uh, the consciousness that we're seeking a theory of is not going to be modular. So um, here's how they, uh, at least to prov provisionally, define what they mean here. They say, a given process involving several mental operations can proceed unconsciously only if a set of adequately interconnect, interconnected modular systems is available to perform each of the required operations, multiple processes can proceed in parallel on their own. So we've got this sort of rough abstract picture of lots of different modules uh, we've talked about, auditory processing, visual processing, memory, motor centers, uh, language centers, uh, they can do their work, and in fact, in the blindsight case we saw in the last lecture, you could see one of those modular units doing some of their work and not getting their information or getting their representational uh, content up to the other systems to where uh, the subject could talk about it. So unconscious processes are often modular. Um, they give an example of a masked uh, fearful face. So remember back to the Tom Cruise example. Uh, that was a masked Tom Cruise face in the uh, uh, the study we looked at. 
um, a fearful face that's just flashed for a moment, primed just for you know 30 milliseconds, and then covered up, will actually cause activity in the facial recognition, and it'll start to invoke an emotional response um, in the viewer, even though the viewer doesn't know that they've um, they've seen this thing happen. So it does happen that these different modules get activated and they operate in parallel. Um, so what we need then, they argue, is that consciousness is required to make the content accessible to the other modules for other tasks. So to get this thing global and up to the level where um, more and more brain systems and more and more co conscious abilities can get access to it, it's got to have this thing consciousness. Okay, so their view is non-modular. They propose that there is a distributed neural system or a workspace with long distance connectivity that can potentially interconnect multiple specialized brain areas in a coordinated though variable manner. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, um, there's a, a, a number of transverse uh, long neurons that actually physically connect these distant different regions of the brain. And um, their view is that when um, you reach a certain uh, high level of activation such that these low-level discriminators are sharing their content by way of these long-distance neurons, um, that, uh, those neural discriminations get shared uh, to all of these other subsystems. And when they achieve that, uh, what Dennett calls fame, um, and they've got all these other systems talking about it, all these other systems doing the same, doing the work on the same patterns, that's when uh, consciousness emerges. It emerges from this kind of coordinated effort and uh, communication across these broad brain regions. Now, that's not to suggest that it has a region or a location or that there's a theater in there. It's just to say that when um, a certain high level of activation starts getting broadcast across different regions of the brain, that's what's in consciousness. So through the workspace, modular systems that do not directly exchange information in an automatic mode can nevertheless gain access to each other's content. So it's this sort of super highway neurons that connect up these different low level systems that let them share uh, their reports and share what they're doing. Uh, the global workspace provides connecting paths for the combination of multiple input, output, and internal system contents. Now, part of this they're getting from just um, looking at actual uh, brain physiology, um, and they're also looking at fMRI studies and looking at the way activation patterns work in the brain. Okay, so one of the big questions they want to answer here is which cognitive processes get connected by the global workspace and which ones don't? Which um, parts of the work that we do in consciousness, in, in, our, in our brains, which parts of that work can become conscious um, content and which is, is excluded. Uh, well, obviously, perceptions about the environment, that's something that, I, that comes in that gets low-level processed and then gets, can obviously get boosted up to be available to me in consciousness. Motor control, as I've been saying, long-term memory, um, quality and reliability evaluations, so credences or probabilities, and that's me making those metacognitive judgments about the contents that I'm, I'm currently having. You know, suppose I'm, um, you know, I meet somebody and I'm suspicious. I think he looks like he's not trustworthy. Uh, and then I ask myself about that feeling. Well, why is it you think that guy's not trustworthy? And now I'm having a meta metacognitive judgment. I'm having a low level sort of emotional reaction about him. And now I'm reflecting on myself. Why is it you think that guy's not trustworthy? And I'm trying to suss out or trying to, to activate you know, you think of it this way is that maybe there's some low level limbic or amygdala uh, system that's getting activated. Um, that's, that's trigger is registering something about, you know, somebody you've run into. I, I, uh, I can't look at the, uh, uh, the, the Trump boys, uh, Donald Trump's sons without being highly suspicious of both of them. Uh, so I grant I'm deeply biased about these two characters. Whenever I see those two, something's going off in my low level, like brainstem about not trusting those two.
So that's the low level discrimination. And then the global workspace idea is that now I'm reflecting on or agonizing over or um, analyzing whether or not that's a trustworthy sensation. So I'm thinking about it. I'm talking about it. I'm remembering it. I'm modeling it. I'm giving it this robust uh, role in my uh, conscious processing. Um, and obviously in cases where we have attentional direction that selectively gate the focus of interest. So we looked at the case of people playing, uh, passing the basketball and they couldn't see the, uh, the gorilla walk through the room. Or um, sometimes I give the example here of a, of a find Waldo puzzle. So you spend 10 minutes you know, um, searching, scouring through the details on a picture to try to find Waldo. Um, that's uh, obviously within the global workspace. It's something that uh, you're conscious of doing and you're directing it. But notice that no amount of introspection or attention gives you access to your blood, blood pressure control or your digestion control or lots of involuntary actions. Like that's, that's all going on in there. Um, there's parts of my cognitive system that are uh, registering and, and activating or, or you know, doing things like making my pupils dilate, but there's nothing at the conscious level that I can do to access that, to boost it, to amplify it, to talk about it, to refer to it. I don't have any internal subjective uh, access to it. So I do have internal subjective access to some things that are going on in these low level representational systems in my um, brain and other things they're just they're, they might as well be completely foreign and alien to me. They're nothing to me. So um, that's why they're, uh, uh, you know, that's how they're triangulating on um, what are the things that can be in consciousness versus can't, and then coming up with this idea that it has to do with these activation patterns across these transverse um, distance neurons in the brain. And obviously, global availability then permits motor and language systems access to contents for verbal or nonverbal reportability. Uh, you know, like my reporting that um, I don't trust the, uh, the Trump sons. Uh, okay, so what's going on here? They call it attentional amplification and dynamic mobilization. So uh, you can think of it in terms of um, I've got some, uh, some neurons that have very simple primitive functions and they uh, recognize or they do the sort of low-level work to recognize a square, or recognize a shape in my visuals field. And um, their, that discriminatory pattern, that representational pattern, then gets broadcast and amplified, maybe because I'm looking for um, a book in the room and I uh, saccade my eyes across all these objects in the room and I discount the the pillows or the round things in the room. I know the book's going to be square, so I scan for and focus and zero in just on square things. So that's uh, an example of top-down attentional amplification, uh, they say, is the mechanism by which modular processes can be temporarily mobilized and made available to the global workspace and therefore to consciousness. So I go searching for the square, I find the square, and then um, that, that, those neurons do their work from the low level to the high level to register, and then that becomes the, uh, the topic or the content that's available in my consciousness. To enter consciousness, it's not sufficient for a process to have ongoing activity. It's not enough just to have this um, low-level uh, system registering that there's a square in the field of vision. This activity must be amplified and maintained over a sufficient duration for it to become accessible to multiple other processes. Without such dynamic mobilization, a process may still contribute to cognitive performance, but only unconsciously. Uh, so that's the difference, perhaps, between the different between um, when you um, you know uh, you looked at a billboard when you're driving down the highway, and the words sort of passed through your system and you read it, but it didn't register and didn't go any further than that. It didn't catch uh, it didn't catch and become um, sort of more broadly amplified across your brain. So it didn't didn't achieve this higher level of consciousness. So it might have had an ongoing. There might be this ongoing activity there. Um, but it's only when you get this um, amplification and this dynamic mobilization that sends the signal across to all these other uh, modules that it becomes, they say, uh, conscious in this formal sense. 
Okay, so now again, to be emphatic about this, consciousness doesn't have a place or a location in the brain as such. Uh, it's a, a kind of dynamic, coordinated activity that's surging back and forth across millions and millions of neurons and um, lots of different features. There's not, I mean, there's obviously neurons that play indispensable roles in it, but um, it's a bit like um, thinking about traffic jams. Like a traffic jam um, uh, uh, changes where it is. Um, if, you, if you watch the map and watch the sort of red zones on Google Maps, uh, depending on traffic flow, uh, the map gets red in different regions at different times. And it's not about the it's not about the the highway. That's not the traffic jam itself. It's the activity levels in those regions um, that leads to it. So uh, they maintain, and this is based on you know their empirical inquiries into uh, what's going on inside the skull is that the contours of the workspace itself, they fluctuate as different brain circuits are temporarily mobilized than demobilized. Uh, so imagine that really complicated task that I described earlier of uh, building a set of bookshelves. So I've got to um, uh, plan, I've got to uh, invoke um, ideas and imagine and think about where I want it and how I want it shaped and, and what features or what proportions do I want it to have, and then imagine all of the various different um, uh, processes that I would engage in order to build the thing, right? So I'm temporarily uh, changing the coalitions of subsystems that are busy, that are occupying and, and, and fo the focus of my attention over the course of the process whereby I'm thinking about and building the bookshelf. So I'm, so I'm uh, engaging different cognitive systems and then they become the, the focus of attention. So this dynamical um, amplification happens and I get focused on this aspect of building the bookshelves for a while and then on this aspect using these systems and then on this aspect using these, these systems and so on. Mobilized and then demobilized. It would therefore be incorrect to identify the workspace and therefore consciousness with a fixed set of brain areas. Uh, so that's partly, that, that's the sort of the, the mid-level point here of them starting with this discussion about modularity and wondering about where to locate the thing. Rather, many brain areas contain workspace neurons with the appropriate long distance and widespread connectivity, and at any given time, only a fraction of these neurons constitute the mobilized workspace. Okay, so Dennett has called this... Um, uh, stepped in here, actually in an article in the same journal or same collection of articles, uh, he calls this process fame in the brain. So consciousness on this account is a kind of, um, of a nebulous dynamic process that unfolds and changes over time. And it's a bit like fame, uh, the, way, the way fame is. Um, there's no single local, localized Cartesian theater where consciousness happens. Information that is already available within a modular process does not need to be re-represented elsewhere for a conscious audience. So you'll recall that we worried about the um, uh, infinite homuncular regress problem in, in Descartes, and we've talked about... Um, what a theory of consciousness is supposed to do. And Dennett's been emphatic that um, ultimately a theory of consciousness is going to render um, this phenomena of consciousness down into something else that's not conscious. So we don't want to have a little guy inside the brain who's looking at a screen, who's watching things go by on the screen like a movie, because if you got a little guy in there who's doing the thinking that way, then that little guy's got to have a little guy in his head doing the work and they being conscious, and then that guy's got to have a little guy in his head being conscious and so on. So we got to get rid of... Um, of a person or an I or a self or a, or a, 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 per, a, 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 a mind in there and render mind into non-mind processes. And that's exactly what uh, Dehane and Nakash are trying to do. And that's why Dennett has sort of jumped in here and said, you know, that these guys, he thinks that these guys are onto the right track. Um, it's more, it's something more akin to uh, fame than an actual sort of theater performance, dynamic mobilization makes it directly available in its original format to all the other workspace processes. So the example I've given here is, you know, imagine you've got the, the network of social media um, that 
the, the net of social media that's encasing the planet right now. So by way of all these phones, you've got all these people on Instagram, and that's the network. And then over the course of the day, there'll be different um, information patterns that will uh, catch on. There'll be one person who uh, notices a picture like this picture of this toddler, this success meme uh, uh, toddler picture I've shown you. You've probably seen this thing. Um, if you haven't, maybe we can stir it up and make it famous again. Um, so you might have seen this. So what happens is there's all these nodes all over the planet of um, social social network uh, nodes, and one of them picks up that pattern, and they like it. They click on it because they like it, and then their friends see it, and some of their friends pick it up, and they spread it, and some of their friends pick it up, and they spread it, and then the pattern, the activation pattern, surges across the planet and um, uh, comes and goes. It mobilizes, uh, becomes a sort of famous for a little while, and then disappears and becomes um, disappears into obscurity for, for a little while, right? So um, there's not like, there are certainly neurons within this system that were activated with the pattern in question during the period, but it need not be uh, confined to a single location. Um, consciousness is more about um, famousness, that that pattern went from being just um, noticed by a single node to being noticed by millions of nodes. Um, but let me, uh, let me point out here that we're also getting close to another interesting question. Sometimes people will say, well, is it possible for something big, a big information processing system like the internet to be conscious? I don't mean to suggest that it is. What Dehane and Akash's argument should make really clear, especially as we get through the rest of this, is that not just any old um, information broadcasting system can do it. Obviously, brains have got a very particular... Um, way in which uh, these activation patterns get amplified and then dynamically um, shared across these different subsystems. So it's not just a matter of having some fame across lots of nodes or just being repeated. It has to be re repeated in very certain particular ways. Um, all of the details of which we can't go into here, but you know, brains have very particular um, um, organic structure to them, right? They're not flat. They're not um, homogenous. They're not built the way social networks are. Um, they have uh, different uh, proportions, different discounts, different activation uh, pathways. They've got highways and tiny pathways and, and so on. So um, there's, a, there's a very different organic profile to the way brains work that produce consciousness um, that can't just happen in any old, any old system. So uh, short answer, no, the internet can't be uh, conscious. Uh, okay, so to make the, the homunculus point one more time, uh, mobilization is a collective dynamic phenomena that requires no supervision here. So Dehane and Nakash are emphatic about that. It's not as if you need some director who's in there pulling levers or pulling switches and making things happen, um, like in that Pixar movie. Uh, the current context causes the spontaneous generation of probabilistic activity patterns in the global workspace neuron. So you've got a bunch of neurons that do perform this work of communicating this information across these different regions. Um, but the consciousness is just to have whatever the current contents are move up into and get picked up and broadcast across these different regions. The probabilistic fluctuations in workspace neurons leads to the sudden, coherent, exclusive, and self-amplification of some subset of workspace neurons with the rest being inhibited. So um, there's all sorts of low-level representational processing going on in your brain all the time, but consciousness has a small kind of uh, window to it. It has a certain depth, a certain... Uh, context. Uh, it can only be so long. It can only hold so much. And when that happens, the, the, the contents that are moving into and out of it um, come in and then they do that to the exclusion of everything else that's going on. So when you're thinking about or talking about the square book on the table, you're not readily able to um, also talk about other stuff at the same time. You've got to switch over to getting the report from those other neurons by way of a different um, set of activation patterns across these global workspace neurons. Okay, so Who's running the show? Well, the short answer is sort of the sub-networks or the whole organization is running itself. This current global workspace state is not random. 
it's heavily constrained and selected by the activation of surrounding processors that encode the behavioral context, the goals, and the rewards of the, organi of the organism, right? So uh, that's a very fancy way, fancy way of you talking, uh, talking about you going down to the kitchen and making a sandwich. Um, and that's you focusing on the target, developing a plan, um, invoking uh, various different subsystems uh, that will help you do the, 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 the little steps that contribute to the bigger steps to accomplishing the goal and shutting out the other, um, the other bigger projects. So there's another good example, right? Um, the, one of the reasons the internet can't be conscious is the internet can't do that. It can't um, form a plan and make a sandwich. <laughs> In the resulting dynamics, uh, Dehane and Akach say, uh, transient self-sustained workspace states follow one another in a constant stream without requir requiring any external supervision. So just think through what it's like to, when your mind wanders and you have various uh, ideas, thoughts, memories, fantasies, images, uh, whatever, sort of coursing, moving up into your conscious awareness and then out and then changing over the course of time. Uh, so the metabolic activity of millions of neurons here acting in concert by, by way of these global workspace neurons uh, to perceive and then amplify and direct and produce consciousness in this kind of rolling temporal process. Okay, so Dehane and Akach then address one of the questions in the room here about the hard problem, right? You'll recall the hard problem from Chalmers, and they say, look, um, you know, Chalmers said, well, how is it that, you know, we can solve the easy problem about how to do neuroscience, but the hard problem is why does it feel like anything? Why is there any subjective sense of phenomena associated with those, those um, uh, neural processes? And uh, here's Dehan and Nakach trying to give an answer. A promising synthesis is now emerging in neuroscience based on the concepts of global workspace, dynamic mobilization, attentional amplification, and frontal circuitry. Some readers may feel that those ideas hardly scratch the surface. So, you know, we consider uh, Chalmers who said, uh, what about the so-called hard problems posed by concepts such as voluntary action, free will, qualia, the sense of self, or the evolution of consciousness? We believe that many of these processes will be found to dissolve once a satisfactory framework for consciousness is achieved. So um, I think you, I think one of our, um, in our earlier accounts, type B materialism or type C materialism from Chalmers, um, he characterized those materialists as saying that in the limit, we would no longer be able to conceive of zombies. And this is Dehane and Nakach saying something very close to that. Um, the idea is once we get enough of the details worked out here, um, you're going to see that uh, why it has to be accompanied by conscious experience and how a zombie actually isn't, um, is, isn't possible. So in the rest of their article, then, they examine how such a dis dissolution might proceed and how will we solve all those various hard problems. So let's consider a couple of them. Um, what about free will? Uh, anterior cingulate and prefrontal cortex areas have been associated with voluntary action and free will in lots of neuroscientific studies. And um, they've suggest, Dehane and Nakach suggest, now we've got a way to think about um, uh, with the global workspace theory about for actions that feel less free or less for they're, they're less free and ones that are more free subjects might call an action or a decision voluntary or free when it's onset onset and realization are controlled by a higher level circuitry and therefore easily modified or withheld because you can redirect it more more readily and automatic or involuntary circuitry if it comes from a more direct or hardwired pathway a pathway down deep so maybe the boundary between so-called free and not free actions is somewhere along that hierarchy um, you set a goal, then select a course of action through the serial evaluations of various alternatives and their possible outcomes. This is you choosing to go make a sandwich. Um, and then they suggest that um, on this view, they've got a kind of compatibilism. So if you might recall this discussion about compatibilism versus incompatibilism in philosophy of mind and in uh, metaphysics, the uh, compatibilists are people who argue that it's possible both for a system to be physically determined and for us to be free. And they say, on this view, the free decision-making occurs at the cognitive or systems level, this high abstract level, not at the, at the low neural level. 
So, a physical system whose successive states unfold according to a deterministic rule can be described as having free will if it is able to represent a goal and to estimate the, the, the outcomes of its actions before initiating them. So they're placing free actions as ones that we reflect on, that we can think about, that we can uh, ponder, and that we can um, engage in some processing before we initiate a choice or make a decision about, you know, whether I'm going to put mayonnaise or mustard on the sandwich. But if you, uh, you know, throw, uh, unexpectedly throw um, uh, something to, at me, especially towards my face, I'm going to flinch or I'm going to dodge and I'm going to grab it or try to deflect it. And that's not going to be free. It's not something I thought about. And I didn't have time to um, process or engage in any kind of this um, higher level abstract reasoning about it. Uh, what about qualia and phenomenal consciousness? I've already hinted an answer here. Um, on the global workspace theory, a large variety of perceptual areas can be mobilized into consciousness with a huge diversity of act activation patterns. Just, you know, just thinking of visual stimuli alone, for instance. The flux, they say, of perceptual experience is too diverse um, in that sort of internal report for accurate verbal description or memory storage. Like I couldn't possibly capture in fine grained detail all of the um, nuances and all of the, I can't come up with words or memory to describe um, all of the things I'm feeling right now, just even just in my visual field, all of the little physical visual details. Um, so the contents therefore of what I saw can't be memorized or transmitted to other members of the species. Um, I can't, all I, the best I could do is sort of use some words to describe it and talk about, you know, what it was like to see the sunset over the, over the Pacific Ocean. And I'm going to use, you know, I'm going to use terms. I'm going to use term discursive concepts like orange and yellow that are going to, um, by their very nature, they're going to dumb down the resolution. They're going to reduce or diminish, um, uh, the actual experience, the experience had all of this rich nuance and detail and uh, fine grained, um, you know, uh, processing all this stuff going on, much of which I, well, I wasn't even aware of or that I was feeling at the time. And the best I can do is come up with words for it. Right. So there's always going to be this sort of qualia, a qualitative gap between what I can describe at the third person level versus what I'm experiencing as the subject of the uh, experience at the first person level. So there's going to be inevitably much that's left out given the millions of subsystems that are engaged in all of this discriminatory work. Um, access to verbal areas, for example, forces distillation and simplification that always leaves elements of the particular subjective situation out. You know, I can talk, I can give you hundreds or thousands of words about the fantastic um, uh, sunset I saw over the Pacific Ocean, but it's not going to, it's always a matter of distillation and rendering down into uh, terms that are communicable to you, but that leave out the subjective actual experience at the, at, uh, at my, from my perspective. Okay, so we, we might anticipate here that Chalmers would say, but why does all of that, all of that processing have to feel like something? Why does it have to feel like anything at all on the inside? Why not just have all of those dis neural discriminations done by the zombie units without any qualitative phenomenal features to it that uh, are the feels that I'm having when I'm undergoing that experience? Um, and so, you know, Chalmers has posed this question, how, how would they answer that, that question? Chalmers has argued that everything could be performed by zombie units with no internal phenomenal feels. But they've argued that without global availability, there are many computational processes that cannot be performed, such as planning, anticipating problems or problem solving, um, that kind of executive level stuff. And could all of those functions be per performed without qualitative content for the subject? Could they all be performed without it feeling like something to the subject? And it, DeHane and Akatra are saying, no, there have to be some subjective state to share with the various subsystems with features. There has to be um, some feels, and that then becomes the subject that all of these various um, transneural um, uh, global workspace neurons then activate on and broadcast across the system in order to make it um, readily available to all this other uh, computational work.
So it seems to me, I don't think they have a full account here. I'd be really curious to hear Dehane and Nakach talk about this more directly. But it seems to me that they're they're arguing that uh, that qualia are necessary in there. They're a product of neural processing, and they're necessary as um, uh, sort of giving shape to the information that's being uh, transmitted across this dynamic amplification process. Uh, okay, so what about the sense of self, self-awareness? Uh, you know, they, they sort of dabble a few of these philosophical problems here at the end of the article. Well, um, they say each brain represents itself at several levels. Um, I'm keeping track of my physical location. My brain is doing a lot of work on my biochemical homeostasis. A person with an identity and an autobiography, I'm keeping track of all of that, of like what I did yesterday, what I'm doing today, what I'm going to do tomorrow. Um, and I also have all these modules that interpret other people's behavior and my own, and they, they collate all of that and put it all together. Um, and I also keep track of my current focus of thought, and there's all this metacognitive ability um, that I have about my own uh, processing. And they say that bringing these modules into the conscious workspace or the global workspace accounts for the subjective sense of self. That is, when you make the when you make the subject the um, object of the processing in global workspace, now you're becoming self-aware. The system is pointed back at itself. Once in the global workspace, the activity of these circuits would be available for inspection by many other processes, thus providing reflexive or higher order consciousness. So the very same story, uh, they tell the very same story here, but now the content is me. Instead of me looking at the sunset over the Pacific, it's me talking about me. And that's how the system then, by way of the global workspace theory, um, is able to subject itself to analysis and become self-aware. And a final section here is a word about the evolution of consciousness. And I've given, um, I've made this brief diversion earlier about the, the evolution of, of consciousness and the movement uh, from uh, fish onto land. Um, they argue that the more an organism can rely on mental simulation and internal evaluation to select a course of action. So that's you sitting there pondering your next move instead of acting out in the open world, which possibly if you've got a bad plan gets you into trouble, the lower are the risks and the expenditure of energy. So this is very much in line with that MacGyver article that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the idea here is um, if I can uh, spend some time um, thinking through the steps in the bookcase plan, thinking about how big I want them, um, where I want them, what I want them to do, how many books I want to store, what have you. If I plan all that out of my head and if I run out a number of different simulations, well, what if I make it this big? What if I do it this way? What if I do it that way? And I run through all these different possibilities in simulation, well, I weed out mistakes. I realize upon thinking about it, oh, that's not the best way to do that. I should try it this way. Oh, wait, don't do that. Do it this way. So I did all of that with zero cost or very little cost. It just took me a bit of time sort of thinking and speculating about it instead of my actually gathering the resources and building the thing, right? So um, uh, the, the deeper and more robust and more detailed and extensive this, um, this consciousness level uh, of processing can go, the, the, the more I, I'm able to do without real-world consequences. And that lets me plan and lets me come up with much better uh, answers. By allowing more sources of knowledge to bear on this internal decision process, the neural workspace may represent an additional step in a general trend towards an increasing internalization of representations in the course of evolution, whose main advantage is the freeing of the organism from its immediate environment. So that fits exactly with this point about um, uh, fish moving onto land, that MacGyver had argued that uh, fish because they're in murky water and can't see a predator or can't see a problem they have to deal with until it's immediately in front of them and they've got to act immediately, uh, give it, have an instantaneous reaction. Once animals moved out onto land, now I can see things 100 yards away, 500 yards away, a mile away. I can see a predator hiding behind a bush and coming out from behind a bush. 
So now I don't, I'm not enslaved by the problems of my immediate re environment. I don't have to deal with just the, the one foot of ocean around me. Now I can start looking out to the horizon and looking out into the distance to plan about who's trying to eat me or who could I possibly eat and what sorts of ways I've now got some time to process and some uh, a bit of capacity to sort of do some uh, scheming about what's the best way to catch my dinner. Okay, so let me summarize the second lecture here. Um, we've seen in the first lecture that much of cognitive processing is unconscious. Some of it's going to stay that way, but in, in some cases, at least for the kinds of modules and systems that, um, uh, you know, uh, fill in the content for human consciousness, attention is the mechanism that boosts it up into conscious availability or global workspace. Consciousness is produced when low-level neuronal process processing moves into the global workspace via a network of long-distance distance neurons that make contents available to a wide range of other systems. So that's been their, uh, this global workspace theory about how consciousness happens. Um, Global, the global workspace is not a location or module. It's a sustained pattern of activations across the brain that has a certain kind of shape, but it need not be combined to particular places. Um, they've argued that the hard problem is starting to get solved. Free will, for instance, um, we might be able to explain free will in terms of uh, voluntary actions, depending on where they are, are located in this hierarchy of um, you know, low level versus high level abstraction, abstracted processing. Um, qualita qualia are, uh, I've suggested, internal reports at the conscious level that give it uh, flavor, that give um, your feelings um, some content that you can then examine. Um, and this flux of perceptual experience is too diverse, they've said, for accurate verbal description or memory storage. So it, it comes off as being kind of ineffable that I can't fully ever uh, communicate or describe what I'm going through as a subject to you. At the best I can do is give a kind of rendered down, distilled, simplified report with language. Um, and they've argued that a self-concept arises or emerges out of the brain out of the brain pointing this global workspace model um, at itself, at taking it, uh, the at the at the the system um, has lots of information about itself, about its spatial location, about its biochemical state, about its autobiography, um, and, and about its interactions. And when the system directs, um, uh, uh, start focus, focuses on itself as an object, that's where the self, uh, concept emerges. And we're actually going to look at another theory, uh, from another neuroscientist, uh, micro Michael Graziano, who's got a, a even more detailed account of how it is that um, self-awareness emerges above and beyond this kind of uh, rudimentary notion of consciousness we've seen in Dehane and Akash. Uh, but next, we're going to look at um, Dennett's uh, analysis of the um, multiple drafts model of consciousness, which ties into everything that Dehane and Nakash have said here.